interpret language strictly, or, 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 nor should you interpret it sloppily. You should interpret it reasonably. If, if, if you strict constructionists give a bad name to serious textualists who say language should be interpreted reasonably, the First Amendment is the example I always give. If if you were a strict constructionist, you would have to believe that Congress could censor handwritten letters because all the First Amendment is the constant abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. A handwritten letter is not speech, it's not the press, so it can be censored, right? No. I mean, a, a proper understanding of the First Amendment, the speech press is, it, is they, they, there's a figure of speech called, oh, I see a sale, the part stands for the yep. whole. Yes, right, right. Is that synecdoche? Synecdoche. 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 Oh, yeah, that's brilliant. I grew up... Uh, <laughs> did you have a Jesuit education? <laughs> I, did, I did not, but I grew up in upstate New York where the English teacher just said, said think of Schenectady. Ah, I see. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, All right, so synecdoche. Synecdoche, and I, I think uh, speech uh, and press are synecdoche standing for the conveyance of ideas, Terrible. expression, whether it's done by semaphore, by Morse code, by burning a flag, so long as your own flag, uh, you're free to express yourself. Another falsity. Again, uh, quoting reading now. <clears throat> the false notion that committee reports and floor speeches are worthwhile aids in statutory construction. Close quote. Mr. Justice Scalia, you have no interest. How much time do we have? You have no interest in probing the intent of a legislature. Well, yes. You, you will rarely find a court that does not say the object of the construction is to discern the intent of the legislature. Right. I say that all the time. I think Aristotle said that. I think it's wrong. At least it's wrong in, 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 in a democracy. We are, as, as the famous line from the Massachusetts Constitution says, a government of laws, not of men. We are governed by the laws that Congress enacts, not by the unexpressed intent of whoever wrote them. And if they meant up when they said down, that's their problem. I frankly, if the legislative history is utterly clear about that, too bad. Uh, we're governed by the laws. So that's point one. You, you shouldn't be worried about their intent. Either. You should be worried, okay. worried about what was what was promulgated to the people. That's what they're about. But secondly, even if you were interested in legislative intent, are you going to find that in legislative history? For one thing, uh, in a, uh. a multi-member body, it's very hard to understand what the intent was beyond the words that they all voted on. Other than that, they could have voted for them for very different reasons. Uh, just because one or two of them say, oh, I think the language does this, the rest may not have felt the same way. So the notion that you can pluck statements from a couple of legislators or even from a committee report, which is usually written by some teenagers and, and, uh, and not even... Members of the Federal Society, if we're lucky. Not, yeah. Not even, not even, not even, very often not even read by the committee, much less read by the okay. whole house. Yeah, so much I need less, to do less read by the other stuff. house. Uh, the, the, the notion that that somehow is reflective of the, the intent of the whole Congress and of the president who had to sign the thing. I mean, it, it truly is the, is the last, uh, the last surviving fiction in America. In American life, there'd be a lot of fictions, you know. This is a fiction. It, it's, uh, you have to engage in a, a willing suspension of disbelief to, uh, to accept that. All so right, <sighs> two more stars. So, the false notion that the living Constitution is an exception to the rule that legal texts must be given the meaning they bore when adopted. Close quote. The argument, of course, is that the, wiser, the framers were wise men. They understood that they were constructing a document for the ages, so they left a little play in the joint. They permitted this thing to breathe, to expand, to adapt. And the, the, the body charged with executing these expansions and adaptions is the judiciary. Yeah. No, they, they, they knew that there would be need for change, and, and that's why they had an amendment provision. 
as some constitutions did not. This constitution could be amended. And uh, if, you, if you listen to John Marshall uh, in, the, in the Bank of the United States case, what enables the application of the constitution to new situations that can't be envisioned by the framers is not the ability of the courts to change the meaning of the Constitution, but rather when the courts interpret provisions of the Constitution, they ought, as John Marshall said, to give those provisions an expansive meaning because they have to, uh, uh, they have to be used in situations that cannot possibly be envisioned. Uh, that's, that's the way in which the Constitution is expandable and flexible, not, uh, uh, not by, by being amendable uh, through the courts. Has the political and legal culture evolved such a oh, in this constitution wall. much too seldom? Uh, we, you mean the people, the through, people. through the formal amount, I mean, the yes, court yes, does yes. it all the time. Uh, um, well, well, I'm sometimes asked, you know, if I would amend any provision of the Constitution, and actually the one provision I would amend is the amendment provision. It's, uh, it's very, very difficult to amend it to mm. infinitely more difficult than it was when, when that provision was written. You know, it takes a two-thirds vote of each house to propose the amendment, and then it has to be uh, appro uh, approved by three-quarters of the states. Um, I figured it out once if you took a bare majority in the smallest states but in the population. Something less than 2% of the population could prevent a constitutional amendment. That's, you know, that's probably too severe. And certainly much worse than it was, you know, the, the, the disparity in population between California and well, Rhode Island is so, so much greater than what existed uh, at the Freeman. So I, I, I would amend that. Ooh. Segment for how it should be done and how it should not. How it should not. Roe versus Wade. Two quotations. Reading law. In Roe versus Wade, the Supreme Court declared unconstitutional state statutes that in no way contradicted any specific provision of the Constitution. Close quote. Second quotation. Justice Blackmun, 1973 opinion itself. The right of privacy, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty or as the district court determined in the Ninth Amendment's reservation of rights to the people is broad enough to encompass a woman's decision whether or not to terminate her pregnancy, close quote. So Justice Blackmun, writing for the majority, takes pains to ground the court's decision. Well, I suppose you could, in the 14th and the 9th, or if you read his, his uh, opinion carefully, it's the 14th or the 9th, you get to choose. And he's wrong. Did, did he's he say the 14th? He, he said the right of privacy, whether, yeah. it be, whether it be founded in the 14th Amendment's concept of personal liberty, as we feel it is, or as the district court determined in the 9th Amendment's reservation of rights to the people. Well, once again, uh, this is one aspect uh, that the book addresses. When you have terms in the Constitution that are not ambiguous in the sense that they can mean one of two things, but rather are general, so that they can cover a lot of things. Uh, you should interpret them not to cover the things that the people who, who adopted that provision did not think they covered. And, you know, no, come on. And punishments is one. Of course, those words could... Uh, cover a lot of things, but it's clear from the history of the times that nobody thought that it included the death penalty. Nobody. And it's the same thing with this, uh, this uh, 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 right of abortion, whether it's founded in the 14th or, I mean, God, the Ninth Amendment, forget about it. Uh, nobody That's ever bad. thought that, uh, I mean, just look at history. Uh, uh, all the states uh, had prohibitions on abortion for hundreds of years. So, so when was it that the American people made the decision to forbid a state from adopting such? They never did. They never did. The court, the court made it up. And, 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 you know, we're not talking about the, the right or wrong of the substantive result. You know, I'm quite really neutral on that. The point is, who should decide? Should it be a question uh, 
on abortion, whether people try to persuade each other that there ought to be, or there ought to be, and, and put it to a vote, that's fine. That's, uh, you know, if you want the right to abortion, create it the way most rights are created in a, in a democracy, you persuade your fellow citizens, pass a law. If you want to abolish the death penalty, the same thing. Uh, but when, all of that uh, democratic choice is taken away, and the court is enabled to give vague provisions such as uh, uh, due process of law, equal protection of the laws, meanings that they, that they did not have when they were adopted. How it should be done. In the 2008 case of District of Columbia versus Heller, in which you wrote the decision upholding the individual right to possess, to possess firearms, a decision that runs to more than 60 pages of very close textual and historical analysis. Reading law, quote, the Second Amendment did not say that the people shall have the right to keep and bear arms, or even that, quote, the government shall not prevent the people from keeping and bearing arms, but rather that the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. This triggered historical inquiry. So how does the history inform the reading of what strikes oh, a human like come on. a very tricky text, that prefatory clause, comma. Well, that, that passage you read triggered, uh, I said it triggered uh, a historical inquiry because um, the Second Amendment refers to it as though it, as though it were a pre-existing right. It didn't say the people shall have the right or even the government shall not take away the right, rather the right of the people to keep in there as though it was a pre-existing right. And that triggered his historical inquiry that takes you back to the English Bill of Rights, which sure enough contained the right to keep and bear arms. As for the prologue, I don't even know what the I can probably still know. PB A well-regulated militia being necessary for the defense of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Uh, Again, if you study history, what's the connection between My not taking so away bad. arms, the, the right of the people to keep them, and the militia? It's, it seems very strange. But historical inquiry shows you what the connection is. The way the Stuart kings, the Catholic kings, uh, destroyed the militia, which was supposed to be all of the uh, uh, male citizens uh, trained to arms, the way they destroyed the militia was not to, by abolishing it, they just took away the arms of all of those who opposed uh, the Catholic kings. And, and so there is a connection. A well-regulated militia being necessary for the defense of a free state, a militia consisting of all of uh, the body of the citizenry, the right of the people to keep their arms from not being infringed. It makes thorough sense if you understand the history. And without the history, uh, you, you ask yourself, what is this guarantee of, split as well. uh, of the state's uh, ability to have a militia? What is it doing in the Bill of Rights, for Pete's sake? Why, you know, why in some other portion? I need to get case. another star, probably from LLO. Segment five, forward and afterward. <clears throat> in reading law, your views are definite. For that matter, the prose itself just conveys a sense of solidity. But you include a foreword by Judge Frank Easterbrook that tosses a banana peel right into the middle of the argument. Quote, quoting Frank Easterbrook's foreword, the significance of an expression depends on how the interpretive community alive uh -huh. at the time of the adoption understood those okay. words. The older the text, the more distant that interpretive community from our own. At some point, the difference becomes so great that the meaning is no longer recoverable. Oh, I Close died. quote. I was so, so the stupid. The Constitution of the United States slowly fading away before our very eyes. Oh, and I'm almost well, I uh, can't disagree with it. I wouldn't have written that. I don't know why Frank wrote that. But, but it's it's Once you invited him to write the forward you were still. It's it's on that well, yeah. I mean Frank's all right, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, and, and he is as much of a textualist as I am. What he said there is entirely true. I mean, when you can't recover the historical meaning, of course you can't do textualism. But that's not the case with respect to the provisions of the Constitution that I'm talking about. We know what the laws were at the time oh, the man. 17th. They're going to be really the, behind. The, uh, the Bill of Rights was adopted in 1791. We knew what. We know what. Sorry, the, so what I have the to get a, the various states were. I have to get the and those laws star, were unchanged, probably. which showed that those people did not think the death penalty was uh, 
was uh, forbidden. You make, actually, you make a contrary point in reading law, that when you first were elevated to the high court, amicus briefs that included historical background were relatively unusual, and now they have become standard. So you would almost be right to argue that the history is coming more sharply into focus rather than fading away. Is that fair? That's fair. I'm just making okay. It up. All right. It's fair. All right. I wouldn't have made the point, but it's, it's, a, it's a fair point. I mean, it's all right. Is either there I can save like three there. minutes it's, in Sky it's anyway. You, you can't retrieve it anymore, yes. You, 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 it's an obstacle to giving the text its original meaning. I guess you have to fall back on, gee, I don't know what it meant originally. Although I'm not sure what you would say is therefore it means what, what I think it ought to mean. Anyway, uh, it, it's a true statement, but it's, it's not a criticism of... All right, got to be careful. Where the history has not been lost, and it hasn't been lost. That's Judge Easterbrook's forward. Here's from your okay. One minute. Afterward. That's not bad. Quote, I have a lot of time to say. Some will argue that a widespread adoption of the techniques we advocate in this book would be to turn back the clock. But we do not propose that all decisions made and doctrine adopted in the past half century or so of unrestrained constitutional improvisation be set aside. We must bow to stare decisis. Close quote. Mr. Justice Scalia, it's not a matter of turning back the clock. It's a matter of restoring the original meaning of the Constitution. You put four, for 400 great, pages, great. you show, you have 400 pages of Mozart, and you end with two and a half pages of a Bronx cheer. You take it all back. <laughs> Say it ain't so. Say it ain't so. OK, so counsel appears uh, before us in the case, and, and uh, he's, he's uh, arguing, he's about to argue that a statute uh, enacted by Congress uh, is unconstitutional. But before he gets in order, oh, wait, 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 Council Matt. Do you think we have the power to ignore a statute enacted by Congress simply because, in our view, it's unconstitutional? This is all, yeah, sure, you know, Marbury versus Madison. I know, I know, Mark, but, but was it right? Let's rethink that. You can't rethink the system. Way, reinvent the wheel every time you have a new case. You have to accept, you know, water over the dam. It's, uh, and that's what stare decisis is all about. It, uh, it, it's a stare decisis is Latin for water over the dam. That's what it is Latin for, right? <laughs> okay. So, but but then you provide these criteria for deciding whether stare decisis should rule. And the criteria are just as vague as, as the criteria that Judge Posner might impose in reading the, the looking for legislative intent. Uh, has it been, is it settled law? Have people arranged their lives around it and so forth? This is all in the afterward. All right, you know, I'm going to save like two minutes here. Number one, the, uh, the number of, of uh, items to which this vagueness applies Unless, is much uh, less than the item, of, uh, the number of items to which uh, Judge Posner's vagueness applies. I mean, you know, the world, the world is his oyster. Any any statute can be interpreted to do what it ought to do. Uh, uh, but secondly, I don't think those criteria that I set forth there are so vague. I, I set forth three um, that that I employ. Number one, how how wrong was it? Is it you know was it blatantly or some of them are maliciously wrong? They Good. must have known they were lying. Okay, that's Plessy. Plessy's on the books for over a half a century before Brown comes along. Well, uh, yeah. That's I'm just sorry. that's just one of my questions. All right, all right, all right. Number two, uh, has it been generally accepted? Uh, you know, uh, when I was in law school, the incorporation doctrine was still was still controversial. Whether the Fourteenth Amendment had the effect of applying the Bill of Rights to the states, it didn't used to apply to the states. But it's been accepted for half a century now. Oh, and, uh, so I... it's, it's no big deal. Number three, uh, compare that with Roe versus Wade, right. which was controversial when adopted and, and remains so. And, and, and apply the first criterion to Roe versus Wade. You know, how bad was it? Even the people that liked the outcome acknowledged that it was a lousy opinion. Third factor, uh, and for me, the most important, really, can, can I, can I, can I work with this case as a lawyer? Uh, and, and, and again, the best example is Roe versus Wade. I don't know how to do Roe versus Wade. I'm supposed to say, does this, 
particular state statute place an undue burden <sighs> on the woman's constitutional right? How do I know where it places one? I'm a lawyer. I would normally run to the law books and see, you know, what's an undue... What do you know? For 200 years, no burden was an undue burden. You could forbid it. This is a policy judgment. I mean, you have a statute that, that requires so many doctors, so many nurses, so many so much expensive equipment and it raises the price of abortion and the issue for my court will be does this place an undue burden what, you know, what am I supposed to do with that as a lawyer I think we're going to talk about law we're not going to talk about law we're going to say I don't think that's an undue do you think it's an undue burden I mean, five hands it is four it isn't I'm not going to do that but you know those are my three criteria I don't think they're very vague at all and uh, uh, when, when, when I find that they strike out on all three, I... Oh, I, come I on. Don't, uh, I don't uh, adhere to I think I'm going to lose time here now. Final question before we go Actually, no, it's audience. fine. In reading law, quote, all right, originalism I can still... does not always provide an easy answer, or even a clear one. Originalism is not perfect, but it is more certain than any other criteria. And it is not too late to restore a strong sense of judicial fidelity to text. Close quote. So here's the question. This book, for that matter, your entire career, represents a sustained, determined effort at restoration. Are you optimistic? How's the project no, that's, coming? That's an unfair question. Especially after last term. <laughs> I dissented in, in, in the last uh, the last six cases in those last games. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that I'm optimistic. I, uh, the fight is worth fighting, uh, win or lose. You know, Frodo in the Lord of the Rings. I'm so, you, 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 you soldier, look at the problem is that the other approach is enormously seductive. Even for the, for the average citizen, it's seductive to think that the Constitution means what it ought to mean. It's a living Constitution. Anything I care passionately about, it's right there in the Constitution. You know, people used to say when, when they don't like something that's going on, they say, there ought to be a law. There used to be a comic strip that, that you know, there ought to be a law about people uh, playing boom boxes in the park and stuff like that. People don't say that anymore. They say, it's unconstitutional. If they really feel passionately about it, uh, and it is even more seductive to judges. Oops. It's a wonderful thing to to have a constitutional case, and you're always happy with the result because it means exactly what you think it ought to mean. Let me ask that last question in a slightly different way, but it's the same question. I was talking to a friend here at Stanford Law School who said when Antonin Scalia was nominated to the Supreme Court in 1986. In the legal academy, yep. the prestigious law schools, originalism was considered dead and gone. And now, if you don't have some pretty good originalists on your faculty, your law school is not to be taken seriously. And that is overwhelmingly the work of one man. Now that I put that you give me way. hope. You uh, give me hope, Peter. <laughs> stay with me. Stay, stay in my chambers. <laughs> All right. We have some questions. We have some questions from the audience. We've made some progress. We I will. I will say. Well, we're, this is a Federalist Society <laughs> sponsoring this event. It didn't exist. Questions from the audience. Is there a negative effect on the judiciary to, uh, of the modern confirmation process? You were confirmed ninety-eight to zip. Those days are over, aren't they? I think they are over. Um, my explanation for why they're over is um, that I told you all this stuff really begins with the Warren Court, or at least that's when this, uh, this living constitutional philosophy sort of takes over. And I think it took the American people a while to figure out what was going on, maybe 30 years. But once they have figured out that the Supreme Court is essentially rewriting the Constitution, term by term, the old criteria for appointing and, and confirming the judges no longer apply. I mean, it's obvious. 
pick somebody who's a good lawyer, that's very nice. And somebody with a, a judicial disposition, wonderful. And, you know, somebody who, uh, uh, you know, is, is an honest man, uh, and so forth. That's all very good. The most important thing is, what kind of a new constitution will this person write? Will he put in the things that I like? And take, in the, take out the things I don't like? And that's what's been going on. Oh, come on. Processes, at least where, 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 where it's okay. Am I PB? Or I die like five the, times, uh, so. Filibuster proof control of one party. Uh, you know, Judge so and so, do you think there's a right to whatever it is, abortion, whatever you hate or, hate or love? You don't? Well, I think it's there. And my constituents think it's there, and I'm not going to put you in this. That's what's going on. And it ought to go on. I, much as I hate that process, I prefer to the alternative, which is just letting the Supreme Court, without any political control, rewrite the Constitution term by term. If they're going to be doing that, I would like uh, some popular control, even if, it, if it's in this, this Byzantine fashion that, 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 that amounts to a mini constitutional convention every time we appoint a new justice. So the corruption of the process stems from the high bench, not from the Senate Judiciary. Yes, uh, they're, they're, they are doing what uh, what you would expect them to do, and what I say they ought to do. If that's if that's what the Supreme Court is doing, that's what the Senate ought to do. Much as I dislike them. How much of the living Constitution is due to the feckless unwillingness of Congress to tackle difficult issues? No, I, I don't think that's a good excuse. Oh, Congress hasn't hasn't done it, so we must do it. Where? Well, where do you get that from? None of it. Zero. Don't blame it on the Congress. It's, it's, it's not the job of, uh, of judges to uh, uh, do those things which the people's representatives have, uh, for, for whatever reason, decided not to do. Even okay, I guess we'll wait another even cycle. When even, even, huh? even when we had, it, as we had a couple of years ago, a sitting speaker of the House referring to a 2,000 and some page document, we'll have, to, we'll have to pass this to find out what's in it. Yeah, I don't think it's up to the court to. Okay. All right, I got three minutes to do this. Yeah, certainly not. Does natural law have a place in interpreting the Constitution? No. <laughs> Look, it, it says what it says. I apply United States law. I don't apply natural law. God applies natural law. The, 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 the only... Now, natural law has a place in writing law. When you're writing a Constitution, or when you're writing a statute, you should not put in that anything that you know or believe is contrary to natural law. But once it's in there, it says what it says. And if it forces me to do something that's against my conscience, of course, I have to resign from the bench. But the mere fact that it doesn't conform to natural law, that it does not cause me to be doing anything evil, that's no basis for me saying, oh, the statute doesn't conform to natural law, so I'll apply the natural law. The only role natural law has under the Constitution is, you mentioned that, did you mention the ninth? There we go. PV, baby. Well, Justice Blackman mm -hmm. mentioned it. Yeah, yeah. Justice Blackman. Well, that, you know, that's the amendment says, that the enumeration herein of certain rights shall not be deemed to deny or disparage other rights that are retained by the people. And uh, uh, academia in recent years, having finally yielded to the reality PV, of baby. substantive due process, uh, which is has been the basis for Roe versus Wade and a lot of the living constitution nonsense, uh, ha having finally conceded that